going to go ahead and hit the record button and we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome to today's session. If you've not taken a minute, if you'll put your name and contact information into the chat. Um, we are recording today's session, as you just heard. This is uh, stored on our Canvas page as well as our YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch it. Um, we share it with others, and it helps us with that quality improvement. Echo, if you've never joined an Echo session, welcome. It is an interactive community, so please ask your questions in chat, raise your hand. If you're comfortable turning on your video, turn on your video. It um, makes it easier for us to know who's on the call and put those names with faces. Um, also that we do case narratives or case discussions. They're a great way to um, gain information from all the amazing people on the call, as well as um, for us to understand and see uh, what's going out there. So if you you're interested and you would consider doing a case, please reach out to us. Um, as any time that we're talking about families or sensitive information, please remember to protect their individual privacy. Avoid using anything that is identifiable. If you have any questions about that, please reach out to one of our amazing hub team members. They all have an asterisk in front of their name. Um, and then uh, key components of an echo session is that we will always have a didactic speaker that shares with us some information and then a case presentation and some recommendations. So we'll do small breakout groups where we all learn from each other. That's the great thing about an echo session or an echo network is that we are a all teach, all learn. Um, everybody on the call has amazing ideas, and so it's really great to hear those and get that information. Um, again, just to build that um, understanding of who's on the call and so that we know uh, who and we could reach out to each other, consider renaming your profile, um, put where you work, what your job title is. Just a great way for all of us to learn um, about each other. Uh, raising your hand, again, you can raise your hand or you can also put your comments in chat. Kurt uh, Phillips helps monitor that for us and he'll um, come off of that. Uh, to get a certificate of attendance, we do ask that you complete the survey. The surveys help us keep these sessions free as well as provide um, kind of guidance of what kind of sessions that we provide. So please fill out those evaluations. We, we will be dropping those into chat um, throughout the session as well as uh, post the email that you get the survey link to. Um, Canvas, if you've not accessed our Canvas, you could email us at earlyecho at usu.edu to get access to our Canvas page. That is where we store everything on and where we have all of our um, information on that. Case studies, again, are a great way to get information about real life situations, learn from all the amazing people on the call, and receive that feedback. If you're interested, please reach out to earlyecho at aggie.usu.edu. Um, if you've not followed us on social media, please take a minute and do so. Um, it, we share resources, any information that presenters share with us, um, updates about our sessions, and any other valuable resources. So I am going to stop sharing and turn the time over to our amazing um, Kirsten that is going to be talking to us today. Let me unmute myself. Hello, everybody. Um, as I go through this, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me or raise your hand or put it in the chat and maybe Kurt can let me know if there's a question in chat. Um, but it's fine to go ahead and ask a question right away. So um, 
Give me just a second to get myself set up here. Okay. So anyway, that doesn't need to be up on the screen. My name is Kirsten Alberg, and I am a board certified clinical specialist in pediatric physical therapy. I've been practicing in early intervention for 15 years. I also teach the pediatric content in the doctor of physical therapy program at the University of Utah. I run the new, uh, brand new pediatric physical therapy residency there at the university. And I'm also on faculty with the Utah Regional Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. And I'm going to be talking today about the benefits of physical activity and autism and the impacts on health and well being. And just to start off, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest or any other conflicts of interest. And then you all have probably heard this before, but I just want to point it out again. Um, most of us were educated to use person first terminology, so to talk about a person with autism. Um, a lot of people especially in autism, but across disabilities are starting to want to use um, disability or identity first language. And just to not think about autism as being just like something that they carry around with them, but it's an integral part of their personality and who they are. Um, and this is coming from the self advocates. And so I will switch back and forth between person first and identity first language throughout the presentation in order to respect both points of view. Um, what I'm going to talk about today are the impacts of physical activity levels in autism, facilitators and barriers to physical activity, and common motor impairments in autism, and then just briefly hit on some of the research relating to motor interventions. So I'm not going to go into a ton of detail um, from the PT aspects, but this is more really designed as an interdisciplinary um, presentation here. What I would like you all to be able to get out of it is to understand the short and long term implications of low physical activity levels in autism. I'd like you to be able to recognize um, some of the physical impairments in people with autism, or at least recognize that maybe their physical activity levels aren't where they should be, and then to be able to develop strategies to address physical activity. And that strategy may be as simple as asking a motor therapist for help, or um, you may want to get a little bit more creative than that. Um, so hopefully you'll get some ideas on that out of this presentation. So in introduction, the World Health Organization recommends 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day for school age children. And I will use that abbreviation MVPA throughout the presentation. So um, if you see that, that's what it is, moderate to physical vigorous physical activity. Um, in the US, our levels are not really great. In the general population, only about 24% of kids are meeting that recommendation. And our autistic kids are only about 15% of them meeting that recommendation. And we do know that physical activity levels um, as children are predictive of what physical activity levels are going to be as adults. So it's not set in stone, but generally speaking, if a child is sedentary, they're more likely to be sedentary as an adult. And if a child is active, they're more likely to be active as an adult. And uh, before I got started, I should have apologized for my voice. I'm a little bit sick today. So if I cough or sneeze, I'll apologize in advance for that. <clears throat> and um, anyway, so why is this important? Um, physical activity really affords opportunities for social learning and social interaction and participation. So for the young child to be able to um, manage playground equipment, um, if, they're, if they're uncomfortable on the playground and they can't get out there and play on the playground, they're losing a lot of opportunities for their social learning where all of their peers are out there um, kind of learning how to interact. And then as the child ages, um, physical activity is really an important part of social participation. So if you think about your own times that you socialize and your kids, what, what they do when they socialize, a lot of those social opportunities um, for participation really involve some sort of physical activity. And so if a child is not able to be physically active, it really limits their opportunities for social participation. Um, and really, in general, friendships facilitate physical activity, and physical activity also facilitates building friendships. Low physical activity contributes to chronic health conditions. So as a PT, this was really hammered into us in um, PT school, and it just seems really obvious, but people that aren't active are going to have more issues with chronic health conditions. Um, and then we know that adults with autism tend to score lower than average on health-related quality of life instruments. Um, and 
when you've got a young child that's, you know, in the early intervention age, um, a lot of times we'll address motor first, but as soon as they get that autism diagnosis or, you know, if the child's really struggling with language and social, um, the motor just kind of falls off as a priority. And the last thing I would want to do is burden an adult or a parent with the idea that, you know, your child's going to have health related quality of life issues when they're an adult that they're, you know, you've got to get going on this physical activity. Um, it, it really does kind of fall off of the priority list, but I want to challenge you today to think of it not really as one more thing that the family needs to do, but how can we integrate some physical activity into the other objectives and other things that we're working on? On, um, and really work across disciplines here and work with each other so that we can incorporate some physical activity into their um, daily life. And so I'm going to talk about some common co-occurring conditions that are impacted by physical activity. So this is not an exhaustive list. I've got a couple of slides here on it, but they're not an exhaustive list on all of the co-occurring conditions that we see with autism, but just the ones that have really well documented links to physical activity. Um, and as I go through this, um, some of the research is related to general population, some is across disabilities, and some is autism specific, and I will um, try to specify that if I remember. Um, so the first bullet point is, um, are people with autism are one and a half to two times more likely than the general population to be obese or overweight? And this is really a chronic issue for us. But we also have all of the associated conditions that go along with that. So diabetes, cardiovascular disease, joint pain, those are all things that people with autism are at an increased risk for. And we know that physical activity has an influence on that. Um, this is probably, for the second bullet point, a conservative estimate, but it is estimated that more than half of kids and people with autism have some sort of gastrointestinal issues with constipation by far and away being the most common. And we do know that gut discomfort is related to behavior, sleep, and food selectivity. So, you know, when a child's backed up, we get a lot of outbursts and we've got a lot of research. I, th I think we all probably have anecdotal experience with this, but we also have a lot of research to tell us that um, kids are gonna act out and behave a little less well when they are not feeling well and when their gut hurts. Um, we know that this gut discomfort and constipation can interfere with sleep, which also has a big influence on our behavior. Um, and then that food selectivity, you kind of get a cycle going here when they're really backed up, they just want you know basically white flour and sugar kind of stuff. Um, and then that doesn't help with that constipation. And so if you've got a child that's chronically constipated, getting them active isn't gonna completely fix it. Um, you're gonna to have to look at it a little bit more comprehensively. But when you look at basic bowel hygiene and keeping um, bowel movements healthy, the, the basic bi bowel hygiene consists of fiber fluids and physical activity. So it's a really important component there. And our physical activity levels do have an influence on that constipation. And then sleep, it's estimated that 50 to 80% of uh, kids with autism have poor sleep. And we know that this affects behavior, it affects learning, and then it also really has a big um, influence on family stress. So if your child with autism is not sleeping well, you've got at least one other family member, if not the whole family, who is, is also not going to be sleeping well. And that just has a really big influence on stress um, for the whole family. And we've got um, randomized clinical, randomized controlled trials um, in the general population across disabilities and specific to autism that tell us that increasing physical activity will improve sleep parameters. And we do know that physical activity during the day is an accepted component of sleep hygiene. And that needs to be during the day, not right before bedtime. Um, but during the day, getting physical activity on a regular basis will help with sleep, which then in turn can really help with behavior. Um, anxiety, we know we have a really high um, co-occurrence of anxiety and autism. So estimated between 40 and 65%. And I think that's in line with what Dr. Builder showed us last month. Um, and we know that physical activity is used in management. Um, for anxiety really within the general population. And that for a lot of people, getting physical activity reduces their need for medications. And then in ADHD, um, 
there's a lot of there's a really high rate i think it's estimated that around 50 percent of people with autism will also have some level of adhd and that's because there's a lot of genetic overlap so what they're finding in their genetic studies with autism is there's not really a single gene but there's a lot of um genes that come up frequently um, and that some of the combination of those genes are contributing to that autism and there's a lot of the same genes that are involved in ADHD. So we do have literature specific to the ADHD population that tells us that aerobic activity has a moderate to large effect on attention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and anxiety. And then in depression, um, that also is pretty common. I don't remember, I didn't put the incidents here, but um, I think it's maybe 20% or so of kids with autism have depression also. And we know that physical activity is used to prevent and treat depression in the general population. So there was a paper written a couple of years ago that um, was really calling for physical activity to be considered central to management of autism. And the justification in this paper was that if you can um, help to manage some of these co occurring conditions with physical activity that you may not need as many meds so we're not nobody's um, proposing that you take meds away that a child might need. Um, but you might need fewer meds or maybe lower doses of meds if you can kind of um, take the edge off of things a little bit with physical activity. And so there aren't really any medications that are given specifically for autism, but if kids with autism are on medications, it's for all of these co-occurring conditions. So they were just calling for really thinking about um, physical activity as being central to management so that you can maybe not have the kids on so many meds and having to deal with the side effects of those. Um, and then also just to think about if physical activity can help in the short term with behavior, sleep, anxiety, constipation, all of these other things, um, that maybe it should be a little bit higher of a priority. So maybe instead of um, just thinking that like, oh, social is more important, we don't really care how coordinated the kid is, um, maybe we should really prioritize getting these kids to be a little bit more active earlier on so that they can um, help to manage some of these other things that go along with it. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, facilitators and barriers to physical activity and we'll look at this from the socio-ecologic model. So on the inside circle we've got the intrapersonal um, and so we'll talk about you know this will be like motor skills the child specific motor skills i'll talk later about motor deficits and so those would be barriers at the interpersonal level and then we've also got the child's personal factors their attitudes their characteristics their motivations and then interpersonal moves into their family and parents their teachers and their peers organizational for children is going to be primarily school and then and EI agencies. Um, and then in the community, we're, we've got people here from a wide um, variety of um, communities. And so all of our community stuff is gonna look a little bit different for us. And then societal is moving into the policies, laws and regulations. And in the social determinants of health literature, you may also see this referred to as downstream, midstream and upstream. So the downstream is kind of more the personal and interpersonal levels. Um, midstream would be more organizational and community and upstream is gonna be our policies and our regulations. So in the red boxes, everything listed there can be a facilitator or a barrier, depending on what you have. So looking first at the intrapersonal level, um, our physical activity tends to be low in kids because they, there's a very high incidence of motor delays. So when they're young, but as the rules and required motor skills for activities become more complex, kids tend to drop off even more and be even less active. So generally a child aging, um, they just get a little bit less active as time goes on. The second bullet point is one of these really obvious things that research has proven for us, and that's that kids that spend more time on screens on the weekends have less physical activity on the weekends. And then um, we know that impaired motor skills are a barrier, first of all, at that young age to just be able to do things. And then as they it continue to age, um, if you're not good at stuff, it's not really much fun for you. So um, if you're not good at motor skills and motor activities and sports, then you tend to not really do them so much. And then um, the last bullet point is kind of edging into the next uh, classification, but it says external regulation positively and significantly significantly related to 
moderate to vigorous physical activity and motivation in inclusive PE classes. And so all that really means is that if you've got even just one teacher or peer who's providing some positive um, support and positive reinforcement for a child, they're going to be more internally motivated to participate in PE class and therefore be more active. And then at the interpersonal level, we know that social engagement can increase uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity and bullying decreases physical activity. So organizational is the schools um, primarily and children with autism tend to get more moderate to vigorous physical activity on school days than they do on weekends, but they average less than 15 minutes during PE and 16 minutes at recess. And so they're still spending a lot of time standing around not really being active during those opportunities. Um, our schools really do present our best opportunity to increase physical activity in kids um, because it removes transportation and financial barriers for families. Kids spend a lot of time at school already, so if we can get them more active while they're there, um, that's really our best opportunity. And then we also know that schools that have good anti-bullying programs um, can facilitate physical activity as well. And as we look at the community, when we think about um, extracurricular programs that kids might be enrolled in, it's really hard to find a program that's appropriate for some kids with autism. Some kids can participate in, in a lot of just basic programs, but finding an appropriate program is difficult. And then even if you can find it, it's likely going to be expensive and you're going to have to worry about transportation. So you've got barriers there as well. And then another thing is just kind of our attitudes within our communities about sport for competition versus doing it for enjoyment or health. So we tend in our country to be very competitive about things. And, um, and so that tends to be really just a barrier for a lot of people because if they're not the best at something, then they may not want to do it. Um, and so we really need to be just encouraging um, being active for, for health reasons and just for enjoyment and that social participation. And then as we get on to the uh, society po policies, laws, and regulation, um, access to care can be a, a barrier or a facilitator if we've got good access. And then really the financial responsibility, who's going to pay for this stuff. So um, schools are really our best opportunity to increase physical activity, but our schools are really chronically under-resourced. And so um, we've had bills in front of both houses of Congress for the last couple of years on um, funding IDEA. So originally when IDEA was enacted, um, the intention was that the federal government would fund 40% of it. And our funding has never been over 15%. And so it got close <laughs> to getting passed and it's probably not gonna happen currently in the, in the current house right now with everything going on there. But, um, but that is just something that each, every time it gets talked about, it gets a little bit closer to that. But that would be something that if we could get to full funding of IDEA, then maybe the schools would have enough resources to be able to um, start to promote some good physical activity programs, um, particularly as after school programs. And then our um, policies, laws, and regulation also really tend to have an inst influence on our research strategies and um, which then will have an impact on some of the future things that we see happening. So I'm going to move into talking about motor deficits, but first of all, kind of why that's important. So this is just a model of interrelationships and up at the top we have motor competence. So that would be basically our motor skills, how good we are at things. And off to the left, we have perceived motor competencies or competence. So that actually is not always necessarily the same thing. And sometimes a perceived motor competence can have more influence on physical activity than the actual motor competence does. Um, in typically developing kids, we know when they're younger, um, they tend to think that they're better at things than they are. And then as they age, they maybe get a little bit more realistic about those motor uh, perceived motor competencies. Um, there's also a relationship between our physical activity and our body composition and our health related fitness. Um, in PT, we differentiate between motor fitness, which can also be called motor competence, which is our coordination and our skill with things. And then our health related fitness is really our body composition, our musculoskeletal strength and endurance, our flexibility, our cardiovascular fitness. So all of these things that contribute to good health and help um, keep those chronic health conditions under control. And so these things are all really very um, interrelated here. And so these early motor deficits are important to look at. 
Um, and that motor competence is an important predictor of physical activity and musculoskeletal fitness le levels across early childhood. So our current estimates are that about 85% of children with autism have gross and or fine motor delays or deficits. And so this is um, a lot of people are really pushing to have motor deficits be considered as a core deficit um, or a, a core um, component of autism. Um, and because it is so, so very common, but it is something that gets ignored or not really thought about or prioritized a lot. Um, we tend to see the motor deficits before the social communication deficits, and that's really simply because um, motor skills typically develop before social, social communication skills do. So we're going to see those deficits first. And then we've got um, a variety of types of studies that tell us that motor skills are predictive of outcomes. And so we've got some retrospective studies. We've got quite a few um, prospective studies in high risk siblings, but some of the things that have been found in the literature are that our gross motor skills, if a child has their motor pulled pretty well together by two years of age, they tend to have better outcomes by four years of age. That's not cause and effect, that's just a correlation there. Um, but we do know that gross motor skills at 13 to 33 months are predictive of the severity of autism. And motor delays at three and six months are predictive of language delays at 18 months and high risk siblings. Motor skills at 10 months are predictive of joint attention at 14 months and language at 36 months and high risk siblings. And then our ball skills are really significant indicators of the severity of autism. And I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. But first of all, why is, you Here, know- it, I have one question before you move on. Sorry, this yeah. is Janelle. Um, do you have a reference or an article that you have for your previous slide that kind of goes over some of those motor delays or predictability? Yeah, there's actually, um, I've got three or four or maybe five pages of references or slides of references at the end okay. of the thing. And if you catch me later, I can tell you specifically which one. The very top one I remember is Sutera. Um, and then the other ones, I, they're, they're all in the in the reference slides. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, so anyway, is there a connection or is this just correlation? Um, so some of the thoughts about the relationships between motor and other domains. Um, motor cognition is something that's out there in the literature now. And the idea here is that we need to understand our own actions in order to understand the actions of others. So this would be the nonverbal communication. So if I'm, you know, crossing my arms and scowling at somebody, but I don't have good enough body awareness to even realize what I'm doing and how that associates with how I'm feeling, how am I supposed to read that on somebody else's face and body language if I don't even know what that means with my own body? Um, and then another thought is that motor learning is really the first l learning that we do. So it's the first time we use a memory, a short term memory. It's the first time we really experiment with trial and error and learn means to an end and cause and effect. Um, and so this kind of sets us up for how we learn. And if we are constantly failing, um, we don't really learn how to learn very well. And then motor skills are also the first place we learn to be really flexible and adaptable in our responses. So in the typical development, um, it, motor development literature, um, it, there's a lot of information out there on how important it is to really have um, a good variety uh, and a rich repertoire of foundational movements so that we've got more ability than to be flexible and adaptive in our motor responses. And so this is really adapting to the literal curveball. Um, and so is there a relationship there between this kind of kids with autism tend to get very rigid in their motor responses and not have that good flexibility and adaptable adaptability? And that would be before we would expect them to be able to do that cognitively. So is there a relationship there? We don't really know, but there's, there's one study that says that maybe there is. <laughs> um, and then um, another line of thought out there is that our visual behavior skills are very much related to motor development. And they're also very related to our social skills. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail in this presentation, but just some of our basic things like being able to really visually attend and being able to glance from one thing to another, that, that's really important to our um, joint attention. If you can't glance from one visual target to another visual target, you're not going to be able to engage in joint attention. And I will hit on that just a little bit more in a bit. 
So um, some common physical impairments that we see, and first of all, I just want to stress that this is a really heterogeneous population. So not every child is going to have maybe even any of these, let alone all of them. Um, and then none of these are exclusive to autism. So these are all things that we see in lots of kids, but this is just kind of general things that we see um, in autism. So kind of their overall general tendencies are that they're delayed in their motor milestones. They tend to be a bit clumsy. They have a really hard time with new or novel tasks. And generally they have low physical activity levels. And again, not all kids. <laughs> Some of those hyperactive kids are, are very active. Um, and then more than half of them are low tone and they're not the super duper really floppy kids, but they are a bit low tone, um, you know, lower than, than average. Um, and then they tend to have poor balance and postural control. And that postural control is really foundational to all um, motor development. Um, and then they have trouble with balance, especially when they're in a visually busy environment or they have sensory conflict. So if something's moving around them, that might, you know, if a kid runs, runs towards them or something, that might throw off um, their balance for them. <clears throat> and then um, for most of us, we use what we call anticipatory balance or postural control more than we do reactive. So I know anytime I'm going to move, I have to shift my weight and I have to do some head riding and all of that. And that all happens without me having to think about it. Or like if I'm going to come up on my toes, I'll actually dorsiflex my ankles a little bit and shift my weight forward before I come up onto my toes. Um, but kids with autism, they don't have that very good anticipatory postural control, so they tend to use more balanced reactions, which is really um, very exhausting to, you know, you can't even like reach for something without falling out of your chair and have or having having to have a balanced reaction to not fall out of your chair. So what this leads to is they tend to just kind of maintain these rigid postures. Um, so even though they're kind of low tone, they're very kind of stiff and rigid in the way that they move. Um, and they don't really like reaching out of their or moving out of their base of support um, because they don't want to fall over or have that sensation that they're going to fall over. And so what we see then is then they don't get this rich repertoire. So they've got this really poor adaptability of movement. And so then they have a really hard time with those um, new tasks without having that anticipatory postural control. We see abnormal gait patterns very frequently. Of course, everybody's familiar with the kids that toe walk, but we also have kids who walk what we call in block, which just means kind of as a big block and really stiff. So we're not getting that nice fluid movement. Um, so if they're walking and in block, they'll tend to have short steps and a wide base of support. And they don't really control their direction very well. So they're not really staggering so much as they'll just kind of veer off to the side. And maybe they'll button, you know, like if they're walking down a long hall, they might bump into one wall and then they'll veer off to the other side and bump off the other wall. Um, but they do bump into things quite a bit and they tend to have trouble with surface transitions. So moving from like the sidewalk to the grass um, or the, the grass to the wood chips at the playground. And then we see decreased midline play um, and by manual exploration. And this shows up as early as four months in high risk uh, siblings. And so initially, you know, at that very young age, that midline control, bringing those hands together is really foundational to self soothing. Um, it's foundational to self eating. Um, and so we see, we tend to just see more asymmetric postures with them and less of that kind of holding everything together in midline, which then contributes then to this ability to do things with two hands where you're, where you're doing different things with your two hands and you're using your vision to guide that. Um, they have difficulty with dual task, linked task, and anything that's timed and they need to do quickly. Um, they're not good with motor imitation in general, and um, I think most Probably everybody on this call knows that generally we'll see motor imitation before we hear speech imitation. And then they have those poor visual behavior skills, which again, I'm not going to go up to into a lot, but um, any study, I've read tons and tons of articles on motor deficits and autism and any study that looks at anything to do with any kind, any visual skill shows that there is a deficit. I've never seen a single article that says that, oh no, <laughs> that they do great. Um, and there actually was just published in September, so just less than two months ago, um, a study with, uh, it was actually two studies combined in one paper with over a thousand kids. And um, they validated using an eye tracking um, tool as a predictor or a screener for autism. So it's kind of the first biomarker that they've got to be able to actually use that to help with the diagnosis of autism. And that's using that visual behavior. 
So I actually give a two hour lecture on this. I've got it bo boiled down to two bullet points for you on balance, development of balance and postural control. So essentially we have three balance systems. We've got our vision, our proprioception or body awareness and our vestibular systems that all work together to provide multi-sensory information. And so the central nervous system then uses all of the sensory information to form an internal representation of our motor skills. So especially if we're going to do something brand new, we're going to form an, an internal picture. And it's not just not just what it looks like, but we're going to also as part of that, what it's going to feel like, how much muscle force we're going to use, how we're going to grade that. Is it going to be a really fast, powerful movement or is it going to be a slow building movement? Um, and so we just kind of naturally do this. And we know that kids with autism, they don't integrate their sensory information or they don't process it well. And so first of all, you need to process it and then you need to take it all together and integrate it to get this um, internal picture and that multisensory information. And so kids with autism don't do that. And that just makes doing a new task really difficult for them. So if you can all imagine if you were going to do something brand new or we see kids at the playground, you see a typically developing kid go to a playground they've never been to before. They can just take one look at something and know how to negotiate it. And you take your kids with autism to a playground and they just kind of, you know, stand around the side and they have no idea how to even approach this stuff. Um, and that's because they don't form that internal picture well. And then the other thing that we see in typically developing children is that they use um, vision as their, oh, I left the word vision out there. Um, <laughs> I think I moved some things around. They use vision as their primary balance system until about age four. And so especially they use their central visual field and then they use those gaze shifts, those glancing from one thing to another. That central visual field is what we need for that bimanual exploration. Um, it's what we need for eye contact. It's what we need for good balance development. And then those gaze shifts are how we um, reference things around us as we're moving. And that's also what we really need for our um, joint attention. And so kids with autism don't use their central visual field um, well, and they don't use gaze shifts well either. So they rely primarily on proprioception, which is their body awareness for their balance. And if they happen to be one of the more than half that have low tone, they're not even going to have that great proprioception in the first place before you even get to the processing level. Um, and so it just makes learning these tasks a lot harder for them if they're not really using these systems in a more typical manner. Um, so I'm going to move into talking about some of the research on motor interventions, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this, but just in general, um, we can improve motor skills with practice and with the appropriate challenge at all ages. So in a systematic review that was done, they really thought or hypothes hypothesized that younger would be better. But it turns out that actually the older kids do just as well with learning new skill. Um, they do feel that the early intervention age is essential for getting that good postural control. So we won't, won't see the same improvements in postural control in older kids that you do um, with younger kids. But in terms of learning a specific skill, older kids do really well with explicit learning, older kids with autism. So, um, you know, with the younger kids, we're really doing mostly implicit. We're not really telling them how to do something. We're just setting up an, an opportunity for them and helping them figure it out. Um, whereas with an older child, you can actually walk them through all the steps of how to do it. And um, kids with autism do really well with that. Um, we've got lots of research over decades that tell us that physical activities decrease the repetitive behaviors or some of the stereotypies that we tend to see. Um, and we know that um, motor interventions have been shown to have effects in other domains. And I'll go into that a little bit more here in the next few slides. And then some of the newer interventions though are combining motor and other domains. And those seem to be the best for those multiple domain improvements. So first of all, just related to health related outcomes. Um, We've got a study telling us that strength and conditioning, and this is not an exhaustive list of all the studies out there. This is just kind of some that I picked, <laughs> um, but there's there's more studies in all of these areas than what I'm listing here. Um, these are just examples, but we know that strength and conditioning um, throughout the school year, twice a week, and that's for 40 minutes, um, can result in improved metabolic profiles, decreased autistic traits on the cars, and improved quality of life per parent proxy questionnaire. 
um, basketball skills two times a week for eight weeks, um, improved sleep and impulse control. And we've got multiple studies on dance, improving general health, independence, quality of life, and interpersonal synchrony. And then fundamental motor skills. So this is basically throwing, catching, and kicking balls, running, jumping, skipping, galloping, and hopping. Um, there have been quite a few studies on this and the approach is they pull the kids out to teach them the fundamental skills, motor skills, and then they put them back into their um, PE class. And what they find is that they spend more time being physically active during PE and they're participating more socially during PE just because they're a little bit better at these skills now and they can actually participate at a higher level. Um, some of the interventions that have looked at social functioning as one of their outcomes. So some of these, they just do just the, the motor activity and they're finding improvements in the other areas. And some of them, they really kind of combine um, their interventions. And so this top one, Game on Autism, is actually a golf program that was done in Australia. And Ernie Els, I think, is the one who was kind of behind this. And for serious golfers, um, golf etiquette, how to behave on the golf course is a really important thing. So they took these kids and they taught them how to golf, but they also taught them golf etiquette. And by the end of a six-week program, these kids were able to go out and golf with their peers. So this this community had an after after school golf program available um, where kids could go after school and go golfing and the kids with autism were able to just go participate with their peers and play golf and be able to be successful. Um, so they they got good enough at golfing, but also at the social aspect of it to be able to participate. Um, the spark program is sports play active recreation for kids and that's similar to the fundamental motor skills, but it's just really teaching them a lot of motor skills and then finding that they have increased social participation once they learn that. Um, aquatic therapy and therapeutic horseback riding have um, been shown to be able to improve social functioning. And then the teach program there's probably people on this call that know more about it than I do. Um, so hopefully I won't butcher it here too much, but you use um, a physical structure and schedules and task or organization to teach kids to be a little bit more independent with stuff and to be able to move from one activity to a next. So um, they've done a couple of studies on this where they've taken a teach program and incorporated physical activity with that and been able to teach the child to be able to follow the structure and be able to follow a schedule and to be able to be organized to move from one thing to another and have it also be physical activity. And then um, cognition, this top one is one of my favorite studies. So this was a 12 week table tennis program. Um, and they found that they improved motor executive function and cognitive flexibility. So table tennis is something that you can't just use the same kind of stroke every time you've got to move around, you've got to be kind of flexible and adaptable in your motor response. And they found that they had carryover um, to cognitive flexibility with this. And it was sustained at 12 weeks post intervention and also generalized to other tasks. Um, and they did incorporate some cognitive flexibility into their training. So one of the things that they did was they had a thing that would shoot out the balls and a, like a serve and that the kids would have to hit it. And they had orange balls and white balls. So one time they would say only hit the white balls and then and let the orange balls go. And then the next time they would have to only hit the orange ball. So they had to switch it up a little bit. Um, but they were able to find that they got this carryover with um, some cognitive flexibility and that they were able to generalize that to other tasks. So I really like that one a lot. Uh, Nigong is a Chinese mind body um, activity and they were able to improve memory and cognitive flexibility. And a third of the population in this study um, had an IQ of less than 70 and they were still able to get those, those nice um, cognitive flexibility and memory improvements. And then extra gaming, um, we have decreased repetitive behaviors, increased attention, improved reaction time, improved working memory, and improved metacognition. And then communication, we've got studies in horseback riding and karate showing some improvements in communication. Um, those are not quite as significant as the social and behavioral outcomes, but there are some improvements there. Um, behavior, we've got enough studies looking at physical activity and behavior to have had a couple of systematic reviews come out. But in general, we find that there are decreased outbursts and repetitive behaviors, improved social emotional functioning, improved attention and cognition. And in this one most recent systematic review, the greatest benefits were with martial arts and horseback riding. Um, and since that systematic review was published, we've also got some good studies with yoga and Ning Gong as far as um, decreasing outburst and improving um, self-control. 
So we know that with typically developing kids, physical activity during the day improves behavior and attention. Um, but one of the things that's really sad is with this population, a lot of times they wind up um, losing their recess um, because they have misbehaved or they're not getting their work done. So their punishment is that they get held in from recess and really they need to be getting out and moving more. And I'm going really long, sorry, <laughs> I just realized that. Um, but just to summarize motor interventions, um, we've had lots of different things that have been studied, um, researched and used successfully in autism. So bottom line is just pick something that you have access to and something that the child likes and you will likely have some success with it. Um, we, I could just say that physical activity is good <laughs> and being sedentary is not, but just to be a little more specific, physical activity has proven short and long-term benefits for health and quality of life in autistic individuals. Um, the motor deficits present early, but they can be addressed at any time. Um, and we can integrate our motor interventions um, into some of our objectives in other domains and use that physical activity to augment those objectives. So it doesn't have to just be something separate that you do. Um, and when you're thinking about how to facilitate um, or how to get some physical activity, consider your facilitators and barriers at multiple levels of the socio-ecologic model when developing a strategy. Um, so for most of our, if you're just working with a single child, you're mostly going to be thinking intra-personal and interpersonal and maybe organizational. Um, but, but, you know, think about all the levels and then choose an activity that the child enjoys. And then there's all those pages of references. So I'm going to stop the share. So do we have any questions? Kristen, that was great. So um, I didn't see any questions in chat and I've not, oh, Audrey, it looks like I'm seeing Audrey's finger go up. I just um, am really was really happy to hear you say uh, that they need lots of practice and appropriate challenges because in working with an eight year old child I work with, um, she is behind in all many many skills and the more you push her the more she pushes back and doesn't have fun and what I'm finding is if um, we just practice 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 she is moving 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 up but it's not nearly you know she's at the level of a five year old maybe. Um, but she is getting them. And I think, okay, you know, at 18, who cares if she got this skill when she was eight or five, um, as long as she's still loving it. So it really helped me to hear that. I really appreciate that. And I think that's one of the tenets of what I do every day is really finding that appropriate challenge. Because if we, if we make the challenge too high, they're not gonna be successful and they're not gonna be motivated to participate. And if we make it too easy, they're not gonna be engaged. And for, for motor skills, we want as much practice as we can get. So we're really looking at that volume of practice and how do we increase it? And I think setting the right challenge is one of the key components. It needs to be fun and meaningful for the child, but then also getting that, that just right challenge is the other key component to getting that volume of practice. So, so thank you for that. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. <laughs> so. So it was all crystal clear. Awesome. <laughs> right? I, was just, I was just going to comment. I appreciate your uh, your presentation. A lot of really great as a physical therapist looking at it and you know, things that I've noticed over the years. I love what you said about balance to the kind of the coalescing all three systems together is the key. And, and when you talk about that with regard um, to their ability to do physical activities, I think that continuous practice to develop that balance system. I mean, we can develop our balance system just like we do our physical system, right? Our strength or that type of stuff. And when we talk about bullying, we talk about, you know, not wanting to participate a lot of times when that balance isn't there, that keeps people from wanting to join because they're always picked last or they're always the one that looks like they don't know what they're doing. And so I really, I, I have an interest in balance myself personally, but um, the ability to, to learn that balance and to learn those skills, doing things they enjoy, and then bringing that across to another skill that they may see happening at school that they'd be able to join in. And, and I just appreciate your, your uh, touching on the balance and the critical nature of balance in being able to, to perform skills, but also in that social atmosphere to be able to be in there coordinated and looking like you know what you do so you feel like you fit in. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kurt. I too appreciate that. That was very, I love the in-depth, the depth of a 
the presentation. It was lovely. Thank you. And as you were saying, Kurt, I mean, so for the adult too. <laughs> It, it's a lifelong um, thing to think about, really, and, and really ultimately what we want for all of our kids is for them to be able to participate and for them to be healthy and happy. And um, and I think that the physical activity, I, I've taught physical therapy students how to address autism for quite a while, but um, when I put this together as more of an interdisciplinary lens, um, it kind of brought a couple of new perspectives into me, you know, like really that short term management of, you know, helping with behavior and helping with sleep and how important that is in the day to day lives of families. Um, so I really enjoyed putting this together because I got a lot of new perspectives out of it. Um, and I think that we as professionals can really work together so that, you know, maybe maybe PT doesn't need to be the main focus, but maybe we can help bring in um, some physical activity into some of the other things that the other professionals are doing um, so that we can all work together on that. And I do find, you know, I, I address, I address the, the visual parts of balance directly, um, but also if you're just playing with balls. So remember those ball skills are, are predictive of severity of autism. And so building those ball skills, they're building those visual behavior skills, which then is going to help them with some of their social functioning, you know, being able to look from one person to another and being able to keep their balance and not, you know, not fall over and not not feel like they're the worst person in the class and everything. Um, and so there, there's just so many things that tie together there. But um, if we can kind of work together to bring physical activity into some of these other interventions that are the priority for the family and rightly so I've I've been there. And, um, you know, and I and I totally get it when a family doesn't want to, you know, have PT or work with motor anymore because they've got these other things that are more important that I think we could be working together um, so that we can bring this in because it's going to help with some of the other things that you're trying to do as well. So. Great. And I'm going to let Mary ask her question and then we'll move on to our case presentation. Thanks. I'm just wondering about um, when we work with these babies that don't have a lot of motor skills at all. What can we, you know, they're not doing ball skills yet and they're not running around yet. What can we, what can we do to incorporate that motor to help with all of these other social and, and other aspects? So at the, at the foundation, <clears throat> our basic motor milestone. So if our child is behind on learning to crawl and learning to walk or they walk and they're bumping into things and they're clumsy and they're not able, able to play on the playground. Um, if you've got access to a motor therapist in your early intervention setting to get some help there if you need to. Um, but basically it's also a lot of providing opportunities again that are at the right challenge. Um, and so, yeah, before we get in, the, the ball skills are a little bit higher level, a little bit older kid, but for these early intervention kids, um, you know, the way they initially learn about their environment is through movement and through exploration. And um, there's there's definitely a link between this um, this visual behavior and their their balance, which is, as Kurt said, so foundational to the rest of everything else that they're going to do. Um, so if those skills aren't clicking, then, um, you know, they're going to just have trouble with those motor skills, which then is going to interfere with that social participation. So I did, a, I, I worked with Katie, who I see on the call um, with a child recently. And the first time I went in, I was like, are you concerned about autism? And just after a few months, I'm like, I don't, I don't know how you feel, Katie, but I wasn't nearly as concerned. <laughs> but I had this great observation of her. We had worked on on some of our our stuff a little bit and she was making some gains but we were at a playground and this little girl had come up and started talking to her and she really wanted to participate with this girl she doesn't have very many words and you know she's all happy and excited and then i saw her face light up she had just been playing on a spinny thing that was about 10 to 15 feet away from them and her face lit up and she was just starting to point and she points at this thing and she goes walking across but she's looking at her finger and where she's pointing she never referenced back to the other child to see if she was paying attention and she got all the way over there she was so happy and so excited and then she turned around and the other child wasn't there she, she just her whole body just you know and her face just dropped it was so sad but it was just such a good demonstration of why she needed to be able to look back and reference this child and what we needed to work on um you know but but it was also just a really good example of that kind of that social participation and social learning that she she really really wanted to you know interact with this other child and she just didn't have the skills to do it 
So I don't know if that answered your question, Mary. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hey, well, don't everybody jump off because we have a, I hope it's a great um, case presentation and I'm really looking forward to gathering your guys's um, thoughts and feedback on it because it is my case that um, we're talking about today. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and get started on it. Can you guys all see this? <clears throat> okay, so my name is Janelle Preston and I work here in our up to three early intervention Part C agency in Northern Utah. Um, I am their autism specialist. So I primarily work with kids that have early indicators of autism. Um, a little background on this case is little Mr. Sheridan lives at home with his mom and dad. He has been delayed severely in all milestones um, all of his life. So he, when he first came in, he, on the BDI, he scored severe across all domains. Um, at 18 months, he was referred to our, what we call our ABC services, and those are our autism specific services um, due to lack of progress in all developments. So a lot of the things that Kirsten was talking about during her presentation really hit home because that's kind of what has been happening with this kiddo. And we've had a lot of team members out there and um, weren't quite sure what to do. So we referred to ABC to look and see if there were some early indicators. Um, at 24 months after he had had some ABC services, we did work to get him a diagnosis of autism with uh, uh, the clinic that is up here at Utah State. Um, some of the primary areas of concern is that he does have a lot of lack of engagement, um, social communication, and mobility. Um, he's a big wanderer. So where Kirsten was talking about some of that, I think you called it block, block walking. That's kind of what little Mr. Sheridan does a lot and he wanders. So he really wanders around that room. That can look like that stereotypic behavior, but it really has to do with his um, wandering as well as he has a lot of limited balance. Um, he can't really step over a rolled up towel to move to a different surface. That's some of the things that we've been working on. Um, he also has a lack of imitation skills. So he really loves hearing songs, but he can't do that motor, um, motor imitation that also Kirsten mentioned during her presentation. Um, he really can't even do a lot of imitation with objects. So then how are we working on some of that imitation of verbal um, responding to it too? Um, some of the goals that we have with Sheridan just recently are um, since he loves um, music and his mom loves to sing and do, um, I think she's a music teacher, uh, is working on some of that dancing. So we wanted to just respond to the music by making a movement, working on some of that balancing. Um, we wanna work on some motor imitation um, and requesting um, preferred items during functional communication. So we have worked on a lot of choice boards with him or using pictures. We've done some signs We've also done physical guidance or physical prompting to help support him during this. So the questions that um, my team would like some answers about is that what are some, some games that the family can play that really increases that mobility and engagement? So when Kirsten was just talking about that interdisciplinary teaming, how do we how do we work on both of those together so that we're all working on it instead of in isolation? Um, we also want to know when the child is really doing that wandering and not necessarily initiating or engaging, how do we help support that communication? Um, the other one is ideas to use that spoon and fork during mealtime because he's not doing that cross midline or he is not always paying attention 
do that. Um, and then the last group to talk about how do you encourage early identification and cross-discipline goals within your agency. So I'm really glad that Kirsten brought that up because that was a big key thing that our team had been struggling with. Um, so I'm gonna, so don't everybody jump off because I'm really wanting some great answers from you guys. So Janelle, so, just real yeah. quick in the chat, this is from Ashley, and this may be something that people could consider in their groups. Um, Ashley says, I'm trying to set up a picky eating group in the St. George area, as is so needed in our community, but have zero experience with billing and group therapy for this. I am hoping I can receive some guidance from with anyone who has experience in this area. So as you go through, be considering that, and that may be some things we can either put into the chat or chat about later on. Okay, and then I also saw Audrey is, how was he diagnosed by 24 months? And um, so we actually have a doctor up here in Northern Utah that is working um, with Paul Carbone out of the U who is doing training on the stats from, uh, for early intervention. And um, so that is how that's how our group got him diagnosed by 24 months. Um, so Kate and Shelby, your guys' group is going to take question number two, where it says the child is wandering and not initiating. Um, and then Pat, your group is going to take Take what are some games that the family can play to increase mobility and engagement? Kurt, your guys' group is going to take that how to use spoon and fork during mealtime. And then Heather, your guys' group is going to take early, that encouraging early identification across cross disciplines um, within your agency. So please take a minute to turn on your cameras, introduce yourself, and um, make sure you assign a note taker. Don't jump off, please. I'm, we really need some ideas and some support on this. So I'm going to open up those rooms. You should see something jumping on. Does everybody see their breakout room? Joanne and Thea, Kyla, Melanie. Joanne, do you see yours? Stephanie. Suzanne. Alicia, do you guys all see your 